guys. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. If you guys want to stand with us, let's worship. Two, three. Does he understand? Sometimes I question, is he able? Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? When I look back, did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did. So yes, he try to tell me I'm forgotten and I've fallen too far from his hands but I know what kind of God he is and I'm trusting in his promises I'm believing and I'm singing yes he can did he move every mountain did he part every sea yes he did so yes he All right, thank you. you. may be seated. I'd like to like welcome everyone to Grace Bible Church this morning. Um, those of you visiting, uh, especially hope that you feel welcome and uh, have a few announcements here. Our weekly newsletter contains all the dates and details about upcoming and ongoing events and ministries. If you're not currently receiving that and would like to, you can sign up for that uh, at the information table. Uh, we're only highlighting one or two activities each week in the announcements, so it's important to pay attention to the newsletter to stay up to date on what's going on. Uh, you can find a copy at the info table and can sign up, as I mentioned, uh, there at the back. Uh, this info can also be found on our website at gbcbellevue.org or on the screen uh, up on the front. Uh, it was on earlier. It may probably be up there later. Also, for those visiting our junior high and high school youth groups, Quench and Lifeline, uh, meet on Sundays after church service. They have food and fellowship, and it includes today. So you're welcome. They're going to be meeting back in the children's ministry area if they want to uh, join in on that. Uh, please see Paula if you're interested in the Christmas cookie exchange and sign up again as on the information table. Paula's got her hand raised here if you have questions. Uh, Ladies, please be watching your emails this week for information about several upcoming events and fellowship opportunities. And then another uh, serving opportunity that we want to make uh, everyone aware of this morning is for audio and video team. 
We're looking for a few volunteers with experience in this field uh, to run the soundboard and uh, music and backup for Paul and Dave sit back there at the table and run the sound and video stuff that you see each morning. Um, if you're interested in that, um, they're going to be on a rotational basis. Uh, we need videographers to run the, the video camera. Video editing help during the week before the videos are posted to the website. Uh, video switch operators uh, once we're live streaming in our new space. Hopefully maybe next month. Um, if you have any experience in any of these areas and are willing to serve in that capacity, uh, see Dave Schellenberg uh, there at the, the table. And uh, there is a sign up again at the information table to be a part of that. Training is available for those with some experience that would like to learn more and are, inter and are interested. Um, we have a couple of birthdays this week. Stuart Smith on the 22nd. And on the 23rd, Zoe Schlesinger will be five years old. We have a couple of, uh, oh no, a couple more birthdays. Uh, Aiden Kleinschmidt, 15, on the 24th. And John Hendrickson has a birthday on the 25th. Doesn't look like we have any uh, anniversaries to celebrate this week. Um, so we do not take up a formal offering. Uh, there is a white box um, back as you first come in the door if you want to contribute there. Also, we have um, Venmo, and you can use the, uh, from your bank account. We appreciate those that uh, choose to give to our ministry here and uh, partner with us. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Dan. Thanks, Jason. Jason does such a good job, they're asking me to play drums more and more. In a moment, we're going to be dismissing the children for um, <clears throat> their uh, classrooms. But before we do that, we want to bring Allie up because we've got kind of a special announcement from her. Um, yesterday, <clears throat> one of our children made chili for, for us at home. And uh, he knows I don't usually like real spicy food. And so I had my first chili yesterday with <clears throat> five habaneros in it. <laughs> so... Um, that was fun. It was tasty. Was it? But yes, but I normally don't get a lot of variety in chili. You have an announcement about chili. I do. I'm excited about this. So I, I hope you guys have all heard about the chili cook-off, but we're going to do it on December 12th. It'll be at 5. It'll go about, thank you, to mm -hmm. 8.30. Um, but it's our first annual one, and we used to do this at my church very long ago, and it received very well. Um, we have sign-ups back there, and we really need you guys to sign up for attendance and chilies and toppings and sides and desserts. But we need that really soon because next week is kind of an off week, and then we only have one week until the yeah. cook-off. Now, when you say your church before, was that Georgia? Yeah, in Georgia. Is, uh, is, uh, is chili in Georgia any different than chili in Nebraska? Chili in Nebraska is way better, sir. It <laughs> <laughs> But the South shall rise again, I guess, something like that. I, um, I don't even know what that means. Okay, along with this, we're going to be voting. So there's going to be voting at each of the tables, and it's kind of like a popularity. Whoever has the best chili, the top three gets prizes. And they may or may not be from the dollar store, but they are <laughs> <laughs> prizes. But the grand prize winner, whoever has the best chili, Chester Davis made this for us. And we're going to have um, like little plaques for every year. That, you can have this. It is going to hang in our building. Whoever wins gets their name on this plaque. I know, okay. right? The stakes are high. H A. Oh, we can. Thank you. H A. Um, so that is a big deal. After the chili, after our fellowship, what? The gauntlet. No. The gauntlet apparently has been thrown. I down. can be paid since I have this. Twenty dollars gets your name on here. This is, a, this is a Christian chili cook-off. Should I leave? <laughs> <laughs> um, but after that, we're going to come together in our new sanctuary, hopefully, and sing like four or five Christmas songs. And then to close out the night, we have a very special participation Christmas song. Ooh. Yeah, okay. And it's a secret. Um, but it'll be a really, really fun night. Sounds like a great night. Nothing makes me think more of Christmas than chili. It, I know, right? Yeah. I know. 
We're looking forward to this. And thank you for, thanks for bringing this up from Georgia. You're welcome. Yeah, it's a land of better chili. So please, well, the only thing, please sign up for chilies. We, all of the, like two tables are dispersed with all of our sign up stuff. So please sign up, especially like today, because I can't get a top, like a toppings count if I don't have a chili count. Today's Does a big that day. Make sense? Today's a big day. Okay, good. Thanks, Allie. Good? That's great. Yeah, right. thank you very much. Appreciate that. Good deal. Well, uh, we're going to take a moment now to do what we do every Sunday. We take the bread before we have uh, the message. And um, if you're a visitor here, uh, we would love to tell you why we do this. Because for us, the death of Christ, the cross of Christ is really a big deal. It's the reason that Christ could offer us everlasting life because he paid completely for all of our sins. Love to talk with you more about that. But for those of you that are believers, this is a great time to take about one minute to settle your heart before God to make sure you're walking with him. And if you find sin in your life, it's a good time to acknowledge that to God to continue to enjoy fellowship. So if you would please join me in a word of prayer. We'll take about a minute to do that and then we'll take the bread together. Thank you, Father, once again for the reminder of all that Jesus has done for us. I pray that it'll never get old because our sins never go away. So we pray that he'll be honored today, that our hearts will be open and teachable with mindset on the things of the Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Gentlemen, if you would. Thank you, Ellie. Early in the 60s, my parents bought a new house, and we moved to a new location, and when we went down there, uh, the adjustment to the new place, to the new living style was challenging for them, and a little bit of a tough year for them financially. A life was different back then, for those of you that don't know, which are a lot of you. Uh, if you were a little bit short on money, you couldn't just pull out a credit card and buy whatever you wanted. You had to make do with what you had because when the money was gone, the money was gone. And so that Christmas was different. It was the most memorable Christmas for me in my entire life. I remember it well because that Christmas, for Christmas, all three of us sons ha uh, got games. One of the games I remember was kind of a French sounding game. We never did quite figure out how to play it. Played the game of life, you know, which was a real game, by the way. And um, I remember that year because I remember how sad uh, mom and dad were because they couldn't get us more. And that Christmas, something changed in me for the better. I was more concerned about them than getting the gifts. I was more concerned about how we got along than I was how much I got. Because I remember the whole time we were playing the games, I felt bad because I knew how bad my parents felt. Best Christmas ever. Best Christmas ever. And you know, perspective will do a lot for you in life. It can turn your attention from you to others. It can give you, in Paul's word, salvation. And we're going to talk about what that means. Not eternal life, but it can give you a whole new view of life. Because in America, what you're seeing gradually, increasingly, across the course of our nation, are people that have lost perspective. They've lost the way they're supposed to view life. And I want to talk to you about a passage that we went over not that long ago together as a church. But when I taught this before, I emphasized that morning something a little bit different in the passage. And today, 
I'd like to look at you uh, with you together at a little bit different side to this passage. And before we go there, I want to give you a little bit of background. We're going to go once again to the book of Philippians. And in the book, Paul is in jail. And while he's in jail, there's a lot of challenges in his life. I've grown to love Philippians so much because it's a book of perspective. It's a book of priorities. It's a book that tells you how to survive with the right attitudes. Because Thanksgiving's coming up. And at Thanksgiving, I don't know what your days are like. But oftentimes, we're consumed with certain things that really are distracting. We're consumed with whether somebody's on time. We're consumed with seeing that uncle or that aunt or that cousin that we really don't like that much. We're consumed with whether or not the food's going to turn out well. We're consumed with all kinds of things, and I would suggest to you that it makes the holidays pressure-packed in a way they shouldn't be. Because from a biblical standpoint, God is far more concerned about how you go through something than necessarily what you go through. He's got the what. What he wants us to deal with is the how. Now, this is and can't be a complete package of how Thanksgiving should go. But I will tell you this, if you do what Scripture tells you to do in this case, it's going to make Thanksgiving a time where you can be thankful. So Paul is in jail. And as we looked at before when we studied the book of Philippians, as he's in jail, he's grateful for the Philippians because they had shared in his spreading the gospel. But while he's in jail, the thought apparently from the church at Philippi was, Okay, everything's messed up. We've been praying for you. We gave you money. And now everything's messed up because you're in jail. Paul writes to tell them this in the first part of the chapter. I'm locked up, but the gospel's not locked up. Do you know the gospel's gotten into the palace because I'm in jail? I've been able to share Christ with the palace guards. Isn't that great? He's saying he gives them perspective. Imagine if Paul had not taken the right perspective. He's in jail and he'd, like, he'd be like me. He'd be saying, look at all the bugs and the rats and the food's lousy and how long am I going to be in here? I don't like the temperature. It's hard to sleep. That would have been me. Paul says otherwise, isn't this great? Because for Paul, his life was consumed about glorifying Christ through his body. For Paul, his life was consumed about the day when he'd meet Jesus. And for Paul, his deliverance wasn't getting out of prison. His deliverance was going through it the right way so that when he stood before Jesus, he could say, I was so proud of you, Paul. So as he talks about it, he explains to them, you know, there are people that are preaching the gospel, some for the right reasons, but do you know there are people that are actually preaching the gospel to cause me pain? They want to hurt me. Now again, if Paul's like me and aren't we glad he's not, he probably would have sat around and overthought the situation and thought, why are they so mad at me? What did I do to upset them? Again, a self-centered life. But instead, Paul gives them perspective. And I want to talk to you about a four-letter word, T-H-I-S, this. I want to talk to you about how important that is. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 1. Happiness relies on happenings, but joy relies on priorities and perspectives. And we're going to talk about that, those priorities and perspectives today. So here we go. Philippians 1, Paul explains what's going on, and he says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Could you believe that? There are people that were doing it just to hurt Paul, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? What's the conclusion, Paul says? How should we react to this? Check this out. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. Now here it comes. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. So, the opponents were trying to cause him grief. Paul's priorities stopped them from causing him harm. See, if your priorities are right, if people are late, if your priority is that everything goes off on time and the clock is ruling your day, yeah, it's a bad day, right? Because you're late. And for me, being late in my life today is not 15 minutes early. And so you can get upset at the traffic. You can get upset because you can't find your keys. You can get upset at all the interruptions in life because the clock is more important to you. And I would suggest this to you, something that I'm learning and haven't learned your children, your wife, your husband, 
are watching the way you react. And you being late isn't one half important, isn't at all as important as the way you do it. I had a father-in-law that helped teach me this. I had a father-in-law that as life would smack him in the face, he'd push back and he'd show us how Jesus would react. And you know, I can't tell you how often dad was late. I can't tell you about anything like that that are my priorities. But I can tell you how he reacted. I remember that. Paul goes on, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. That's my priority. I want him glorified. And in this, I will rejoice. Yes, he says with a determination, and I will rejoice. I'm going to have joy in it because my priorities are right. And so look at this. Paul's perspective was to rejoice when his priorities were intact. If your priority is being on time like mine can be, and the clock governs you, you're more concerned whether you're late than whether you sin against someone else. And I'm a veteran of that because I failed a thousand times because of the clock. I hate telling you that, but it's true. Now watch this second this. For I know this will turn out for my deliverance. That's your word salvation in the original language. I know this will turn out for my salvation. Paul's a believer. He's an apostle. What salvation is he talking about? That's key. What's he, when he says, I know this will turn out for my deliverance, what's he talking about? My choosing to look at it with joy will be my deliverance. You catch that? Don't miss this because this is the key to it all. At, at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, if you decide to have your priorities right you, and you have joy over it, that's going to be your deliverance. His deliverance, he tells you what his deliverance is. We're going to look at it in a minute. And he says, this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus. I'm going to have joy. You pray, the Spirit will give power. Paul's deliverance or salvation whether in, was not whether or not he was in jail. I would have said, well, hey, my deliverance, my salvation will be getting out of this place. That wasn't Paul's deliverance. Paul says, my deliverance is that I would not be ashamed at the judgment seat. He, look what he says. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. See, because right now in my life, the growing desire of my heart is that I finish faithful, that I make it successfully through the difficulties. With all boldness, as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, I don't know how you react to somebody saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think that's a better goal than Dan Hauge's goal at time, which is for me to be on time is life. Or that the food turns out right. And so on. And so his priority was that Christ would be exalted, whether by life or by death. What's yours? Because you're going to have arguments and you're going to have stress at Thanksgiving and at Christmas if your priorities are messed up. The way you go through it's more important than what you go through. Paul dissects this. It's on your notes. Look what he says. I find this so interesting. He says, in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this rejoicing will turn out from my salvation. What was his salvation? through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit, according to my earnest hope and expectation that in nothing I shall be ashamed. I want to finish my life clean. I want to stand before Jesus unashamed. Remember Hebrews 12? For those who say such thing make it plain that they desire another city, a better city. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God's proud of you when you live by faith. He goes on and he says, Nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body. Hey, my goal is that Christ is exalted. That's what I want. That's my deliverance. I can rejoice because my priorities are right. You get your priorities wrong, your perspective gets off, you don't rejoice. There's stress. To live as Christ and to die as gain. You can't lose with that. You can't miss as long as he's glorified. And so... Now, I'm going to go through this quickly, but look what he says here. 
But if I live in the flesh, <laughs> this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I can't tell. Ugh, do I want to live or die? Ooh, tough call. I'm hard pressed between the two. Really? Yeah. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, we're like, oh, Paul, that'd be terrible if you died. He goes, that's a lot better. Paul, you may die. He goes, yeah, isn't it great? Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Where's this perspective? I, I care about you. And being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. His priority was Jesus Christ. His perspective involved pleasing Jesus and pleases, pleasing Jesus to Paul meant loving people, and that's what he wanted. He explains, he says, what I want for you only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's your priority. So that when you drive, I want to honor him. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Why is that so critical? Because as the pressure grows out there, it's reflected in here, and it affects our relationships in the body of Christ, in the local church. Not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition. It shows they're going to catch it, but to you of salvation. There is that word again and that from God. Really, it's a proof. how is it a proof of salvation? Well, here's how the context makes sense. For to you, it's been granted on behalf of Christ. It's been granted not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You've been given a gift, he says to them. You're suffering just like I'm suffering. My salvation is to not be ashamed. I want your deliverance to be the same. I want you to stand unashamed before him. God's blessed you. How has he blessed you? With suffering. You have a chance to have a better future. But that better future comes if you have the right priorities and perspectives. If you're unified, if you're not fighting, if you don't let the pressures of the world destroy your relationships with others. And I want your salvation too because he's given you the privilege of suffering. That's a different take. That's a different approach. Their opponents were trying to hurt them just like they hurt Paul. The answer, act like Paul. Love the brethren. Keep your priorities right. Keep your perspective right. You'd have no shame at what we call the Bema seat, the judgment seat, where believers answer for how they live. Weird. His focus was on the future. And if your focus is on the future, your focus can be on the family. Somebody should use that. So what are our priorities and perspective? He goes on. If there's, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, and by the way, the ifs here, you could translate all of them since. If there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. You want to make me happy in prison? Here's how you do it. Being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another, like New American Standard here, more important than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Because if you're going to love Jesus and have the right priorities, it has to involve his people. Because loving others is more important than the clock, more important than the turkey, more important than anything else. That's your priority. So it's a divine perspective. And divine priorities put the needs of others first. Because I don't know what you're like at the holidays, but sometimes when you're in those large groups, you can develop insecurity and you become more worried about what people are saying about you and how you're coming off and it's me, me, me. And Paul says, love like Jesus loved. So seek to please God. Look at, there's a pretty good example of this. Here's Jesus let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not, did not regard equality with God something to be held on to, grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's your example for Thanksgiving and Christmas, because, I don't know, silly me, I think God's interested in a thankful heart. He's interested in how we do Christmas. I don't know how he got in. I, I know a lot of people don't like him there. So that's a divine perspective. And same thing, same words. Put others per first. 
Seek to please God. Quit focusing on you. Therefore, God's response to Jesus, God's response to Jesus having the right priorities, therefore God highly exalted him and put, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, God rewards divine perspectives and divine priorities. You say, why do I care about that? Because the goal is your salvation to be delivered. The goal is that through these difficulties you'll stand before him unashamed. Because at the end of the day, that's more important than, than the turkey or the ham or whatever. Jesus did what Paul did. He was unashamed before God. And Jesus, therefore, was greatly rewarded for it. If you remember the context the next group of verses will make a lot more sense to you. Therefore, my beloved, because of the way Paul lived, because of the way Jesus lived, as you always have obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what he's not saying? He's not saying, figure out whether or not you're a Christian. Salvation all the way through this passage has been the same. It's to be delivered through trials unashamed before God. Salvation all the way through is to be delivered through trial to be unashamed before God. And if you'll hang with that definition, this will all make more sense of you. Work it out. Why? Because God's working in you. You ever think about that during the day? So that when you're late or the turkey gets burned or when someone at work is a pain and you're having trouble at home, God's working in you because it can't come to you unless he allows it. It can't touch you if he doesn't allow it. And he's working in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So live your life so you stand unashamed before him. So, you're, here's what Paul's saying. You're going through what you're going through. You need to work it out, not being ashamed at the judgment seat, just like me. I'm in jail. They're trying to hurt me. And I'm going to rejoice. I choose to look at it with delight. That's what joy is, delight. God can't command an emotion. And yet in Scripture, he says, when we're in sin, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to sorrow, your joy to gloom. What's he saying? If you look at the situation the right way, the emotions will follow. And you know what? I'll bet you this. I bet you that Jesus would rather you had hamburgers with joy than to have a tense home and a great meal. It's better, Proverbs says, than a house full of feasting with strife. And the sad thing is this man standing before you has created atmospheres at time where I'm that guy. Let's sit down and praise Jesus. We're going to have Thanksgiving and you better like it. Some of you know what that's like. Better is a house, full, a house of love than a house full of feasting with strife, Proverbs says to that effect. My goodness, guys, we've lost sight of it all. And it's more important for us to win and to have our way than to have Jesus. And you know, I know what it's like to play a silly board game and have the best Christmas of my life. Paul says, recognize what you do. God is working in you. Don't act like life is an accident. It can't touch you without God's permission. Work out your own self. Live life in such a way that you can be delivered through that trial and you can stand before Jesus and said, I love the way you handled that. So proud of you. I know that was hard on you. I know you didn't want the day to go that way, but you showed your family what a man of God, what a woman of God acts like. So the next verse now makes sense, doesn't it? I remember reading this for years and going, what is this doing here? I thought he was saying, hey, this is how you figure out whether you're saved or not. No, no, no. So he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. I want to talk to you about something that happens to me. I know you're saying, I'm tired of hearing about you. I get it, but I'm a great example of sin. I, there's times in my life that I get into moods. Does anybody in the room ever get into moods? And every, good, that's, yeah, we, we need to hang out. I need you in my life. And so what happens is one thing will go wrong, then something else goes, oh, this day's just, da, 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 why, why are we alive? And why did we buy this house? And how, how these shoes? I hate these shoes. I don't, you know, everything gets bad. You ever get like that? You go dark. Don't go dark this Thanksgiving. 
Choose to have joy. Choose to look at it this way. And you know what, guys? If you blow it, for the sake of Jesus, don't, if you blow it, don't stay with life blown up. Hey, I'm sorry I acted the way I acted. I kind of lost it. I apologize. Let's make this a good time. Because you know what? You can play silly board games and have a great holiday. And 60 years after it happens, you're still going to remember it. Because I don't remember a lot of Christmases, but I remember that Christmas. It was the best. So don't go dark, because what can happen is you get into a mood and it colors everything. Paul had every reason to have a mood, did he not? He was being jailed unjustly. And he said, I refuse to do it. I will rejoice, and he says determinedly, yes, I will rejoice. I will look at it this way so that my emotions follow. Because I get into moods and it gets ugly. I mean to tell you. So, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as the lights in the world, holding fast the words of life that I may rejoice, that I may rejoice, Paul says, in the day of Christ that I have not run or in vain or labored in vain. I want you to give me joy because we, can, we, can't go, we can't go dark and expect to be unashamed. But if you fail, you can confess and get back on the road again. Like Paul, their salvation started with the joy that comes from faith, perspectives, and priorities. Focus, again, on the future. A disciple's behavior impacts the teacher's future. And so Paul says, if you learn this, I'm going to have joy in the future. Now let's go, let's end today with another passage where he wraps this up because Judea and Syntyche are having arguments. They're believers, they're co-workers, they're in the ministry with Paul, but here's what's happened. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, notice he gets reward for their behavior. Stand fast in the Lord. I implore Judea and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. That's a word that's used all the way through to have the right mindset, perspective. I urge you also, true companion, help these women. You've got an obligation to other believers who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers. And by the way, your names are in the book of life. And there's the answer to the age-old question, who, oh, I wonder, wonder, Jesus writes that one. In the book of life, just like the holidays, there's family trouble, right? There's family trouble, but you have the same perspective. And when you do, you can help them through this. Whatever else is true, we're family, and that matters. So, here's a familiar one. Don't let its familiarity stop you from learning. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? See, that's crazy. That's crazy talk if there's not a God in heaven. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says it again like he didn't get it. I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, that's a fun word, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Let's talk about this. It's a command to take the light. Notice he doesn't say you got to be nuts and you've got to love burnt turkeys or people that are late. He says, I want you to rejoice in me because I got this. Don't live life as though I'm not a living God who's on the throne. I've got this. You rejoice in the Lord, and he says it twice. The word gentleness is a great word. Not insisting on every right of letter of law, yielding, gentle, courteous, tolerant. It's not a person who's always winning who's got to win. It's not a person who needs their way, but it's a person who says, I'll give in. See, here again, my dad-in-law, that was, that was him. He, he chose to not make issues all the time and made life so much sweeter because he believed Jesus. And I understand that because I live with his daughter. She's the same way. And he says, the Lord is near. He's about to come. You're going to be evaluated. You're going to be judged. The future's important. Be unashamed. We're going to be evaluated. And so he says these crazy, ver- rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And you say, well, isn't that sweet little cute little verse? But then you know how it ends? For this is God, the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What does he want for your Thanksgiving and Christmas? He wants you to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything to give thanks. And that's a crazy verse if there's no God. But there is, and it's not. And the word that's not mentioned in that passage is faith, but it's smeared all over it. Because there are men and women, there's a God who loves you. There's a God who's on the throne. There's a God who's got this. 
If you believe that, life goes one way. If you don't, it goes another way. And so, be anxious for nothing. Are you kidding? Re- rejoice in the Lord always. Be anxious for nothing. Oh, come on, how about a little bit? I mean, this is worth being anxious over, isn't it? I can worry about this. You'd worry about this, wouldn't you? No. But in everything, see, nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving. By the way, that in the Lord, in the last verse is critical, and here, with thanksgiving is the key. You're asking God and you're thanking him. Why? Because you're going to the Lord and you say, Lord, I just pray that there'll be peace in the family this Thanksgiving. I pray that I'll reflect your love and your care to other people. Thank you that you're going to answer this prayer. Will we always get what we want the way we want it? No. No. Faith is smeared all over this. But Father, it's not possible for something to happen if you don't lie. When I ask this, you're good and you're all powerful. If it happens, it's not possible for it to happen without your hand. So thank you. Thank you for the yeses. Thank you for the noes. Thank you for the not yet. But thank you. Because you're God. And Father, you love me. Your son died for me. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Those of you that have heard this story 20 times, please forgive me. But those of you that are not, I want to tell you a story about when our son went to Ecuador, because this verse was on my mind. And uh, I prayed, and he was down in Ecuador, and there were M13 gangs in poverty, and he told us stories on the phone about rats the size of cats walking past his window. He told us a story about killing a spider the size of his hand in his bathroom. And I told you when I told you the story before, the spider was scurrying for the crack in the wall that would have put it in his bedroom. And as he sat there looking at that spider, terrified, he said, I had to decide, do I want to have that spider in my bedroom or do I want to kill it now? And he went into attack mode. And he won. And I don't think he wears those sandals to this day. And I prayed when, when he went down there, and I, and I prayed that night. I said, Father, please take care of our son. Please protect all these things. And I got up the next day after a very few hours sleep, and I called my mentor, and I said, it didn't work. I pressed the button, and it didn't work. I prayed in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I let my request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, did not God guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. But the button didn't work. And he said something very simple but very profound. He said, Dan, there's something about God or his word that you don't think is true. You don't believe it. And I examined it myself and I said, well, I believe God's all powerful. I believe that. And I believe he loves me. And what I told you when I shared this story before was, I think, a key problem. I believe he loved me like he loved the blob. I wasn't special to him. And was he going to answer? Kind of. But you know how God answers things sometimes. He doesn't always get it right. I mean, sometimes he answers, and it's just not the right answer. And we don't like what he gives us. And I thought, maybe you didn't really hear me. So please, 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 because if you ask, if you say please more than once, he really hears you, right? And what if he blows it this time? What if he fails? What if he doesn't give me what I want? Blasphemous, terrible, but a confession this morning. I said to, to my mentor, well, what if he dies? And he knocked me off my chair. Thousands of miles away, he said, what then, Dan? Isn't that very much better? (sighs) Do you really want what God wants in your life? Do you really trust him and want what's best? No, I want my way. I want him to want my way. So I had to realize I really didn't believe God loved me special. Ugh, that stinks. And there's times I think we all struggle with that. Do you care about me, my needs especially? Did you really hear? Where's the answer? Where's what I've asked for? Well, my son's home today doing just great. Spider didn't get him. The rats didn't get him. The M13 gangs didn't get him. And I've learned a little bit more and I'm still in process. I wish I could tell you that now I pray and I always leave with God. I don't. I'm getting there. I'm getting to believe what's true. I'm getting to the place where I see what's true. And when that happens, the peace of God guards my heart and my mind. Nothing, everything with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, that's the key because that's what's coming up. Thank you, Lord Jesus, whatever you say, because you love me more than I can imagine, and you've got this. We request and we thank him because we believe him, men and women. Finally, (laughs) 
This is my prayer almost every single night. Lord, help me to think about what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. My translation. If there's any virtue, anything, meditate on these things. That word meditate, it's a good word. The focus of our thinking is supposed to be on good things. Even our thinking is to be by faith. Paul provides an example of how things are done. So that word meditate, when he says to meditate, it's a different word. It means that you ponder it. you're, You're thinking it through. And that's to be our focus. Not the budget resolution. Not the border crisis. Not inflation. Not things that the world's trying to distract us with. Because how often... How often do we realize how much things have shifted? For example, my parents, if you would have, uh, there's a joke in the movie Back to the Future. Remember where they're watching the, the honeymooners on television? And he says, yeah, that, we've got two televisions. And they laugh at him. They said, nobody has two televisions. Some of you in the room know that was funny when he said that. Some of you think, that's not funny. You've got televisions everywhere. And we've oftentimes looked at our beautiful television set and I said my folks would be blown away to see what we see on television today my folks would be amazed to 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 see that we just go in and load our cart up with whatever we want my folks would be amazed to know that what we enjoy today and their parents would have been amazed with what they enjoyed because we have so much we don't even notice and my suggestion to all of us would be father I pray this will be a, a year of thanksgiving Father, give me eyes to see, because Proverbs says the hearing ear and the seeing eye, they both alike are from the Lord. And with all due respect to everybody in this room, because I include myself, we don't see and we don't hear. And because we don't, we're not grateful. And so we miss things until we lose them, like health, like family members. Because I also learned a few years after that Christmas with the board games, what it was like to not have that mother that created such a wonderful Thanksgiving and Christmas every single year. And it made me a little more grateful, but there's 10,000 things that I still miss every year, every day. And I want to close with this thought with you men and women. In Romans 1, there's an interesting indictment. It says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. But we stop there. It's unfortunate because the next verse says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And with all kindness, I think every one of us in this room suppress the truth in unrighteousness. He goes on and says, For that which is known about God is evident to them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And then he goes on, he says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They did not honor him as God or give thanks. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity and so on. That's everybody in this room, men and women. And when God doesn't get the honor and the glory for the good things he's given us, we're suppressing truth about God. In Hebrews it says, it's impossible without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's good. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so this Thanksgiving, don't suppress truth. You tell people about the good things of God. You show them a person that has priorities and perspective right. That's what will make this a good Thanksgiving. Not everything running on time, not the food being perfect, but a thanksgiving where Jesus Christ is exalted in your homes. Would you join me this Thanksgiving in honoring the one who deserves to be honored? Let's pray, and then we'll sing about it together. Our Father, I have sinned in so many, many ways. My immaturity is stunning in my life. I don't even see what I don't see. And what we see as a fellowship is our lives covered with mercy and how we praise you for that mercy, Father. And I pray, Lord, that this Thanksgiving we will make 
a Thanksgiving where when we spend time together, we're unwrapping board games and we realize that they're not what we had expected. But we have great joy because our priorities get right and our perspective is right. And I pray this will extend beyond Thanksgiving to Christmas, to the new year and beyond in our lives that we might be more like Jesus, not just as individuals, but as a fellowship in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us, let's worship. Jesus 
Hello. Oh, there we go. Magic. Okay. Uh, at Grace Bible Church, we uh, we like to close each service with by taking the cup um, as a remembrance, a symbol of the new covenant that we have in Christ, and we in, invite uh, all believers to join in with us. So I'll uh, pray, and then the be dismissed to go take it. Lord, is so thankful that. Uh, that you love us. Um, Lord, will we look forward to the future, but we also uh, remember the sacrifice that you made. Um, thankful that while we were yet sinners, you died for us and you love us and made us a part of your family. Just uh, thank you for this body, this congregation uh, that come here this morning and uh, pray these things in your name. Amen.
Well, if you guys would like to stand with us, we have one more song before we close. long walk <laughs> someday we're going home and when we go home I'll be so glad but there's nothing there's nothing nothing I want more than for him to look at me and say I was so proud of you let's pray together our father I pray that that day will come soon today it'd be wonderful we'd all take it I just thank you so much for the assurance we have in Christ and the security that's found in him Help us, Father, to have joy during this season. Help us to take that perspective, to seek to have our priorities right, to honor you, and to not get caught up in what the season tries to pull us down into. May your son be honored, and may you use these weak vessels, all of us, in a way that honors you. One of the great miracles of all of life is that your spirit can work through us. Thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Before you go, got to know about the chili cook-off. Get at the sign-up table. Lord bless you guys. Have a great week. Great Thanksgiving.